been trying to figure out the Christian life. Anybody else here trying to figure out the Christian life? Yeah. I've come to a conclusion. It's kind of like herding cats. It's not easy. This thing, trying to uh, pursue Christ, it's not easy. Um, I'm constantly seeing new areas in my life where God wants to change me. He wants to transform who I am today into who he wants me to be tomorrow. And um, it's kind of like, uh, I used to be a painter, and not the uh, Rembrandt type, the um, house painter type. And uh, I'd get done with the wall. You know what I'd do when I was working on an interior? I would take my big old double set of halogen lamps and I'd bring it up close. Because I want you to know, the closer you draw to the light, you can find every flaw. Every spot you missed, every spot where it's a little lighter than the rest, you can see it. And I want you to know, I, I, I just, I've realized that as I keep pursuing Christ, as I draw close to the light of Christ, it seems that he keeps finding more and more things or keeps revealing to me more and more things that need remedied, that need changed, some things that need forsaken, other things that I need to do that basically I'm leaving undone. It's kind of like herding cats. It's just, it seems like I've got a hundred different things I need to do if I want to even hope to be like Christ, to be like Jesus. But I want you to be encouraged this morning, all right? I want us to look into the Word of God in Romans chapter 7. We're going to discover the Apostle Paul, who God used to write about half of the New Testament, all right? He struggled with the exact same thing. All right? Let's go there. I'm going to start in verse 14. And he writes, Now we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. What's he saying there? He's saying the good things that I want to do, that I desire to do, I get gung-ho about it, and the next thing I realize, I'm not even doing them anymore. I'm doing the very things that I don't want to do, starting to play with the old sin things that I used to do that God wants to pull me away from. And then he goes on. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. Amen? Is that you this morning? Do we have a desire to do what is good? Yeah, absolutely. But, the Apostle Paul says, I can't carry it out. When you translate that phrase from the Greek, it means I get it started, but I can't keep it going. Have you ever started like, oh, I'm going to read through the Bible this year, and about the middle of February, you realize you're about three weeks behind? Yeah. All right, I see a few of you doing this. You know, yeah, I get it. Been there, done it myself. Listen to what he says here. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature, but I have this desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Man. So, in verse 21, it says, I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there beside me. Man, can I identify with that. It sounds just like what Jesus said. Remember when he said, be careful, sin crouches at your door, looking to trip you up? That's what Jesus said. Remember he said that there is the enemy of our soul who creeps about like a lion seeking whom he would devour, whom he might be able to sift like wheat? That's what this, I mean, this is the Apostle Paul saying, yep, I'm living it. I'm living it. I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. We love to hear the word of God. We love to, to hear the standard, the, what we can aspire to by, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We delight in that. But he goes on. But I see another law 
at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Wow, it's like he read my mind. He's giving utterance to what I'm experiencing in the day to day. And then here comes the big, massive stroke here at the end. This is the, um, I guess it would be called the coup d'etat of the passage. Thanks be to God. In other words, he finally gives us the solution. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself and my mind am a slave to God's law. In other words, I'm sold out to doing God's deal. I want to do the things he wants me to do. I want to forsake the things he wants me to forsake. But in the sinful nature... Yep, still a slave to the law of sin. That's it. Right there's the human predicament. That's where we who would struggle to herd cats, we who would struggle to pursue Christ, it's where we find ourselves. There was a mom who was uh, preparing breakfast for her little two-year-old daughter. And she asked her little toddler, now what would you like for breakfast, dear? A bagel or a bowl of cereal? And the little girl answered, chocolate. And her mom said, no, 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 this is breakfast time, sweetheart. Now what would you like? Would you like a bagel or a bowl of cereal? And this time with a little renewed passion, the girl says, I'd like chocolate, please. And her mom says, you will not be getting any chocolate until after lunch. Now, would you like a bagel? or a bowl of cereal. And the girl said with a grin, I'd like lunch. (laughs) Now, that little girl was determined. Why? Because she was having a craving. You ever had a craving before? All right, some of you know what I'm talking about. Develop an appetite for something. You know, maybe it's ice cream at midnight, or um, I don't know, hot wings during the big game. When does your appetite or when does your craving tend to flare up? You know, we crave flavors with our taste buds, but if you'll think about it, even more so, we begin to crave with our memories and and even the essence of who we are. Our soul itself begins to have cravings as we mature, as we grow up in life. As life unfolds, our kind of like good food memories are too often gradually replaced by appetites of a different nature. Instead of, you know, wanting something sweet or salty, we decide that we desire something a little more expensive, heady, if you will, sometimes a toxic mixture. See, our appetite no longer is whetted by honey or gravy or something that's tasty, but now it's whetted by... Success, advancement. I mean, who here has never had a craving for more money? Huh? More security, more power, more influence. Those kind of cravings take place. And see, what happens is, as we grow older, our appetites tend to shift from something tasty to something that looks more like a takeover. And all throughout Scripture, throughout the Gospels, and here again in Paul's letter to the Romans, God confronts us with our appetites, our desires. And we can identify with the Apostle's lament about how much he wanted to do something better than what he was doing in the day-to-day. He wanted to do it right. Paul the Pharisee, who had lived his whole life according to the letter of the law, wrote with regret I do not do the things that I want to do. I do the very things that I hate. I succumb to the sin. It was both kind of like a personal apologetic and a profound confession. Paul's confession in this letter to the Romans is one of the most vulnerable, open moments in all of Holy Writ. I mean... Is there anyone here who's 
gone through life without ever wishing that you hadn't said something? You know, where you bit your tongue a few moments too late? Where you wished you could like, hit the rewind button and pull those words back? I mean, all of us have gone through this, where we've said down some stupid, nasty remark or done some bad greed that we've regretted, that we wish we could recall, you know, like call it back. I think about empty excuses I've made. Perhaps it's a promise that's been broken. And with all of us, Paul admits, you know, I can will what is right, I can want to do it right, and I can get started, but it's like I can't carry it through. It's like herding cats. It never ends. And that is the human predicament. In a nutshell, we know what is good, we want to do what is good, and then we do something else. And then we feel the weight of that wrong decision, mostly. I mean, maybe, hopefully. So do you know what I mean when I say that chasing this idea of being like Christ sometimes seems like herding cats? You know, I I look at this passage and I realize appeasing our appetites is not always a good thing. When we do what we want... It seems like it almost never end up, ends up being what we ultimately really wanted. Have you, have you figured that out in life? You know, uh, there's a distinct difference between what our most basic human nature wants and what we know with our whole heart and our whole soul is something that we should desire. Fulfilling wants, that's easy to do. That's, that comes fast and furious, you know? I want a cheeseburger, done. Go to Mickey D's, it's over, right? But fulfilling the desire of your heart, that's different. Take something more. It, it, there's a vast chasm separating our earthly appetites and our eternal desires. Don't be fooled. Finding a way to discern our true desires, our eternal desires, the things that that really feed and fulfill our soul, I'm discovering that just takes Jesus. You don't find it in satisfying wants. You only find it when you really begin seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then Jesus adds all those other things unto you, and you begin to feel fulfilled. But it's when you're pursuing his deal that your own fulfillment comes. So instead of having an appetite for, uh, you know, chocolate, Jesus gives us a desire for something more, something more than a melt-in-the-mouth chocolatey experience, something that sustains our soul for a lifetime. If you've ever introduced someone to Jesus Christ, you know what I'm talking about. When you walk away from that conversation when you see them again and the feelings that come, when you know that you made a difference for someone in eternity, you know what I'm talking about. Something that sustains our soul for a lifetime. And Jesus gives us that desire to love God, to love others, and to make disciples, to share with others. Because that's what we've been born to do, to make disciples. So just think this through with me, because this whole passage, it really is about appetite and desire. Paul's personal appetite had been for success. In other words, he was climbing the corporate ladder. He was going up through the ranks of the Pharisees to become large and in charge. Make no doubt about it. He was a scholar, head of the class. He was a Roman citizen. He was a respected Pharisee and quickly becoming a rising ruler. And his appetite for success had been sated and satisfied as he was placed in charge. In fact, he was the guy who was placed in charge to squelch this Jesus thing. He was willing to kill other people to advance his career. Read the book of Acts. Early on, you see this man who became the Apostle Paul 
holding the coat of one named Stephen, the first martyr of the church, holding his coat because he was officiating over the procedure. He said, put the man to death. Why? So that he might rise. So that he might be successful. So that he could climb the ladder. But Paul's wants, his desire, his longing for personal redemption was unfulfilled until he met Christ on the Damascus Road. It was only after Paul's personal experience with the risen Christ that he realized the satisfaction of his previous appetites had nothing to do with an eternal or a soul satisfaction. It was only after Paul's encounter with Jesus that he felt the desires of his earthly life miraculously and suddenly fulfilled in the love of God and the joy of others, of loving others and sharing with others. I mean, it was how he, his life is marked as the one who built the church. He went around, he couldn't shut up. He was telling everybody he knew about Jesus and everybody he didn't know, he was just quick to tell them. When Paul met up with Jesus on the Damascus Road, he, he didn't just lose his um, pecking order place on the ladder of success. He lost everything. I mean, he lost it all. But he gained something more than everything. He moved from the realm of appetite to the realm of desire. He moved from the temporal to the eternal. He began doing things that were truly fulfilling. Success changed for him when he welcomed the crucified, maligned, and rejected Messiah. Suddenly his desires were reordered. His big success moments were ones like bringing Gentiles, people who had no chance into salvation through Christ. See, that's the difference between an appetite and a desire. When Jesus comes into our lives, he doesn't change our appetites so much as he revolutionizes our desires. All of us have appetites. You know, the grace of God exchanges the supremacy of our biological or our temporal appetites, you know, for the supremacy of a divine desire within our heart to love him, to love others, to make disciples. To each one of us comes a moment where we've got to make a decision. Each one of us has to decide. We're going to live life according to our appetites, feed the desire of the temporal, our flesh, or are we going to live life according to the desires of a changed and redeemed heart, one where we pursue things a bit more eternal, where we're actually seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and trusting that Jesus will add all those other things to us, and he does. He truly does on the authority of his word. He gives us all these things richly to enjoy when we are first seeking him. So which way will you go? The desire of the temporal, the human flesh, or the desires of a redeemed heart? You know, we go pell-mell down the highway of life with the majority who are just chasing their own selfish aims? Or will you take a road less taken? Pursue a newfound set of desires that God will place within your heart. Let me close with the story, a legend, if you will, about the 16th century Spanish Castilian and explorer by the name of Pizarro. I think 1740s to or 1470s is about when he was out exploring the globe. He was down in a place called um, Panama. And uh, he was with his soldiers there, and their number had been decimated. He was down to 12 men. And they had been on what seemed like a futile 
um, mission, and that was to find a place that we would come to call Peru, all right? So you know where Panama's at. He's got a ways to go. He's got to head south if he wants to find Peru, right? But the idea was that if they could just find this land that uh, we call Peru, they would find riches untold. But his numbers were down to 12, and even then they had started to kind of uh, grumble, complain, maybe even think about revolt. Some of them expressed a desire to just settle down there in Panama, which had become their outpost. Uh, though it was a poor country, it was a beautiful country, it was friendly, it was a comfortable place that they could settle down. Besides, none of them knew what lied ahead if they pursued this mission any further. No one knew the difficulties, the hardships, which might lie right around the bend. So Pizarro called his men together, and dramatically he pulled out his sword and made a line from east to west in the sand in front of him. Friends and comrades, he said, on my side of this line are toil and hunger, na nakedness, drenching storms, mountains, deserts, and death. On your side, ease and pleasure. On this side lies Peru with its uncertainty and endless possibilities. On yours, Panama, its surety and safety. Choose each one of you what best becomes a brave Castilian. For my part, I go south. In short, Pizarro invited his men to herd cats rather than stay put and herd cattle. He invited them to a more difficult road. He challenged them to take a road less taken, but one that would end with great reward. Recall with me, if you would, that there was a time when Jesus wrote something in the sand. You remember that? We don't know what he wrote there, but we know it was more than a line. <laughs> it was an invitation to open up the human heart to new desires, not old appetites. The only line in the sand Jesus ever drew was an invitation to step over the line, to love to be loved, and to invite others to join you on that path. If you think about it, these are the only two storylines that have ever been written in any lines in the sand or in the sands of time. But the price of this desire, the desire to love as God loves, <laughs> the desire to share that with others, the price is high. Because you know what? The price for love is always high. It always involves the possibility or the risk of a broken heart. If you've ever known someone who did come into the family and then left, you know the broken heart of which I speak. If you've ever had the family member who refuses to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, you know the broken heart of which I speak. By the way, Pizarro's remnant to uh, of men, they responded to his challenge. They resolutely turned with him and went south. Would you choose this day to cross the line, to follow Jesus to a new heart's desire? Saints, don't beat yourself up when you find yourself not doing the things that you want to do, the good that you want to do. Don't beat yourself up when you find yourself not doing the things that God's called you to. The answer's simple. When you find yourself doing something that we call sin, don't beat yourself up. Just stop doing it 
and keep on the journey with Christ. When you're going down that journey and you realize that you're leaving undone those things that he's called you to do, don't beat yourself up. Just start doing them. Take a step. The way may lead to the south. The way may lead through hardship. It may be a more difficult path, but it's the only way to go if you want to travel with the king. Simply put, I challenge you this day to take the road less taken, to embrace the idea that with Jesus, even herding cats is possible. Let's pray. Almighty God, we hear your word. It rings with authority in our ears and within our hearts. And we believe. Help us in our unbelief. In those moments where your Holy Spirit kind of touches our conscience to reveal things that we are doing that are not of you. Lord, help us not to beat ourselves up. And Lord, please help us not to look at someone else who's struggling and shoot our own wounded. But Lord, help us to just begin again afresh, anew, remembering that in you, in your Son, in Christ, all the old has passed away and a new day has come. Lord, help us as we try to herd cats, as we try to chase down all these different things, as we try to figure it out, as we try to pursue the calling that you've placed before us. Just help us to embrace Christ afresh and anew. And Lord, we pray it in his name that it might be done. If you pray that with me, would you say amen?